Hi, and welcome to Global Governance Futures, based out of the Global Governance Institute at University College London. This is a podcast about the challenges facing humanity and possible global responses. If you're new to the show and you want to get a list of our favourite books, other resources, listen to past shows and to join our community, go to ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance. We're really delighted to have Jacqueline McGlade on the podcast today. Jackie is Professor of Resilience and Sustainable Development at University College London and Frank Jackson Professor of the Environment at Gresham College. Trained in marine biology, biochemistry, aquatic sciences, and zoology, Jackie is a world-leading authority on climate change, ecosystems, oceans, and social system dynamics. She also brings extensive policy experience to this task, having worked as Executive Director for the European Environment Agency from 2003 to 2013, followed by a stint as Chief Scientist and Director of the Science Division at the UN Environment Programme based in Nairobi until 2017. More recently, Jackie has been immersed in fieldwork in Africa as a professor at the Maasai Mara University in Kenya, working closely with the Maasai people to help design and implement clean tech and green growth local projects in the famous Maasai Mara National Reserve. Along the way, Jackie has also become a member of the Maasai tribe when she married a Maasai chief in 2016. More on that perhaps in a minute. She is a passionate advocate for incorporating indigenous knowledge into resiliency planning for the multiple ecological challenges that we face this coming century. And in making this argument, Jackie brings a holistic approach to bear, one which draws on both cutting edge scientific debate and ethical philosophy, emphasizing the importance of a values led approach to action. So we're really excited to have a chance to chat with you. Jackie, thanks so much for joining us. Before we begin, I'll just invite the pod crew to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Tom Pegram, Associate Professor Global Governance at UCL and co-host of the podcast. And yeah, really delighted to finally meet you, Jackie. Really looking forward to this. Hi, I'm Zoe. I help out with the social media and the research and the podcast. And I'm super, super excited to hear about your whole life, basically. And I'm Jessica Canese. I am also a uh, a co-founder and I help with the research and I'm the host today. To get us started, um, could you give us some insight into your personal and professional trajectory as someone who has not only held senior agency posts at the UN and EU, putting into use extensive academic training in sustainability, marine biology, and environmental informatics, and also more recently been closely involved in fieldwork projects? Um, How do you tie all of these threads together? And what is it like to move between such diverse social worlds? Uh, well, it is really interesting because from the outside, it sort of looks really organized. But uh, the way I've arrived at different places is inherently haphazard. Uh, I tend to sort of react to different uh, different sittings, different settings, situations. And as a result of that, I found myself in sort of really interesting conversations, which I would never have predicted from the beginning. But I think what's fundamental to all of this is being really truthful about the real world, Um, trying to seek sort of integrity between data, context and people and rationalizing it in such a way that it makes sense to both policymakers, to the academic world and, and holds true to the robustness of what science and research really seek all the time, but is also meaningful to real real people because there's no point in doing a lot of research if at the end it makes no sense to somebody on the ground who's probably much closer to the reality uh, and, and you know I- independently is heuristically looking at the world. And I guess my job, and I've loved this, is bridging those three communities all the time, back and forth between the, ty- the different kinds of questions that people ask. Yes, I think that the um, uh, academic structure has lost perhaps the connection to uh, people who are actually experiencing what we are studying. Um, So perhaps you could speak on how the academic world lost its connection or if it ever had it in the first place. 
I mean, I think the way the academic world has been structured over centuries has inherently been very elitist. I mean, by, by its very nature, it, you know, you essentially weed out and weed out and you, you end up with people who, for, for want of a better word, are, consider themselves to be intellectually superior. Um, but I, I've never really, I, I sort of have never really engaged in the academic world in that sense. I love research for the simple reason that people around you are continuously pushing the boundaries of knowledge and proving you wrong, making you rethink your whole position. And I like that questioning. I like curiosity and I like uh, different, different ideas to come in from another discipline. I've always really loved the idea that looking at, let's say, a stone, uh, an artist will look at it in one way, a geologist will look at it in another way, biologists will look at it in another way, um, and somebody who's just tired will just sit on it. And I, I think that's the love that I have, is that even objects in the world have got so many stories associated with them that you can weave yourself into very different environments and, and really satisfy curiosity and research. And I was very lucky because when I was trained, I was trained from many, many different disciplines um, by chance. You know, I happened to go into a, a degree structure which was like a triple honours. And so I, I was looking from the microscopic up to the global, uh, all at the same time. And I think that's really uh, tended to characterise what I've, I've done all the way through my life, is look from the tiny to the macroscopic and try and understand those relationships. Uh, yeah, no, that sounds really fascinating, Jackie. And I think uh, someone who also sits obviously within the academy, but has a, a strong interest in policy applied research and also the lived experience of those individuals that we yeah. are indeed trying to uh, trying to understand how they operate in the world and how we relate with one another in the world and what that might mean for, for actually addressing some of these big challenges. I mean, modern university is very much built upon disciplinary specialisms, there's quite a strong silo dynamic often, although we talk a lot about cross-disciplinarity, of course. But it seems that there's rather more emphasis on, say, accumulation of knowledge than perhaps the cultivation of wisdom. And I know colleagues such as Nick Maxwell at UCL and, and others have really been arguing strongly for decades that we need to shift towards a more cross-disciplinary holistic approach. And I thought perhaps to pick that up with you, uh, if we focus on the question of resilience, uh, you've mm -hmm. done a lot of work on resilience. Resilience is something of a buzzword these days. Uh, it's something which I've come across in my own research, of course, and I know that you've you've read deeply into the, the pioneers of this field, such as Buzz Holling and others who worked on resilience within the context of complex system dynamics. But resilience often also can, can sort of, I suppose, seem... Uh, a bit superficial, a bit shallow, a bit tamed even by the mainstream usage. So could you help us understand you know, what is the value of resilience in the context of development, in the context of the climate crisis, but also how, how do we actually arrive at a rigorous understanding of resilience uh, across disciplinary divides? Well, it's, it is really a difficult setting when you have one word that captures so much complexity and so many different disciplines. So it's trite to say resilience is the ability to bounce back or to sort of recapture a trajectory that you were on having been knocked off it, maybe from a climate event or even a personal event. But in a way, it's very good to have a vernacular word. So when one's talking to lots of different groups, they get the initial sense of what it is you're after. And that's really important. Um, so to have that word, but of course, when you think about the word resilience in many different languages, it has very, very different meanings. And so it, it's, it's important as an academic to recognize it's not just the disciplinary process of defining it, but it's also the linguistic process of defining it. And so if I was to think about my earlier work back in the 70s with Buzz Holling and others, it was very much about that systems dynamic. You know, could we describe a world in which you would prod it, create a sort of an event, do something stochastic, and this system would refine itself, it would regain, or what did it take to push it over a threshold? And those were really interesting questions at the time because, 
we were entering into a lot of cybernetics. You know, the computers were ramping up and even their connectivity was a matter of some conversation about whether there was resilience in the way that computers would be able to continue talking to each other and communicating messages and signals and so forth before you got to some threshold and it was saturated and then the whole thing would just collapse. And we know over you know centuries that of course populations have been exposed over uh, you know different been exposed to different things like climatology or population explosions which have then led them to their demise so that lack of resilience but i think in recent times climate change has sort of changed the conversation because what it's done is made it possible for us to recognize that resilience is a connected process it's a relational process and that simply being resilient in your own little silo is no longer good enough you know i could build the best flood defense around my house but if upstream somebody has effectively you know destroyed the whole catchment's ability to absorb water very likely that that big flood defense that i built you know the 10 foot wall could easily become overtopped and so resilience has taken on a, a sort of a much I think deeper understanding that it goes through many different layers. It could even be at the molecular layer. And we know from human health that our ability to withstand stress is not just about hormones and for example, levels of cortisol or steroids in our body, but it actually reflects a long-term pattern of our nutritional status from being within the uh, in, in uterus and in the placenta all the way through and why do we know that? Well, we know that if children are malnourished in those first thousand days, they, they bear the hallmark of that by the lack of the development of the cognitive abilities, the executive powers. And those are fundamental to our ability to withstand shocks and stresses. So you see that on the one hand, you can fix malnutrition by essentially ramping up the nutrition that children under five can get. But if you're not careful and you miss that window of opportunity, children don't develop so that when they become adolescents, they don't have that control. So put those young people into a setting of, say, street riots or a lot of tumult or a lot of you know, uproar and, and different things happening. They don't have the self-checking, that kind of ability to moderate behavior. And that leads to effectively a loss of resilience because just like with a touch paper, a crowd becomes something much more violent and much more threatening. So resilience comes in all these different packages and it has a long tail of effect. So it's, it's a useful word and, it, and one can go deeper and deeper and deeper with it. Long, long, long after Buzz Holling had his ideas of you know, cascading and fast dynamics and slow dynamics, I think we're beginning to really understand that. Yeah, I mean, from what you're saying, it really makes me think, I think often we, perhaps sort of drawing on the, the, the physical sciences, we think of resilience in terms of, say, um, Johan Rockstrom's recent work on planetary boundaries, but you're bringing to the fore also the issue of, of, of culture and yeah. sort of the social malleability of, of um, culture and the way in which uh, so, certain social arrangements are more or less resilient uh, right. in, in the face of, right. of challenges problems, predicaments. And I, I guess uh, also I was curious to ask if we sort of, if you cast your mind back uh, to, to, your early, to your early work, I mean, there was a, a sober conversation in the 1970s around limits to growth, around planetary limits, around ecological interdependence. And that seemed to sort of just fade out with, I suppose, the, the end of the Jimmy Carter administration. Uh, you know, it's, it's a new morning in America, the whole sort of Reagan zeitgeist. Um, yeah. But it's very much back with a vengeance now. And there's a growing sense it feels as if uh, people are waking up to this the reality that some of the dynamics of our industrial civilization are antithetical to resilience uh, and i've seen you setting out this the, you know setting this out and drawing on rather very interesting work by people such as Cormac Cullinan, who has observed that our legacy institutions in the West really encourage the exploitation of the earth. And we need to somehow find our way back to conserving nature as a way of life. So I wonder how then do we begin this task 
as a culture which is wedded to narratives of accumulation, extraction, uh, prosperity, and also not just at sort of that the, the big macro industrial scale, but also, of course, at the very individual personal level, you know, very much prosperity as personal advancement and, uh, and a strong anthropocentrism as well. You've touched on many things, and maybe I'll take us back a little bit. Uh, the limits to growth. I think it was one of those messages that people didn't really want to hear. It was a sort of negative image, and, you know, we live on a small planet. And this was not the message of the 70s and 80s, which was about fantastic technologies. They were going to take us into the future. They were going to solve all the problems, essentially. And we had a, a sort of an uprising, in a way, from both academia, engineering, and science to really think about this idea of initially the technology was going to take us through. But then there was a kickback and we had another school of thought emerging, which really took us into the beginning of this century, which was about decoupling. Could we decouple this growth from all of the bad side, you know, the, the environmental pollution, the overuse of resources? So there was a whole series through the International Resource Panel at UNEP, which I was involved in, which was really trying to set out a new mathematics of resources, which was there's the sort of absolute decoupling and the relative decoupling. So, you know, you, you add a bit of GDP, the sort of the, the, the gross domestic product, our economic performance, and you sort of decouple that from how much resource you use to, to get that into the economy. And then you sort of free yourself through sort of technology in, in improvements to the absolute decoupling. But my personal view is that that's a misunderstanding of how to live on planet Earth, because there are limits. And what um, Johan Rockström and, and many of my colleagues and others, in talking about the, the planetary boundaries, they were realizing that in the not too distant future, we were gonna hit these boundaries once again. And what's happened is climate change has really brought us up abruptly and said, well, you know, these things are all connected. And if you start digging the ground and go, continue to put stuff up into the atmosphere or in places where it shouldn't be, then you're going to hit thresholds left, right and center. So my kind of the, the, the rubric whereby I wish to you know, go forward is a completely different approach. Uh, I have a student who's working on the frugal economy, which I'm not sure is going to go down very well, because I think that already turns people off. But what I'm trying to think about is an economy, and I mean this in the broadest sense, I mean the societal and the economic picture, which re-engages human beings with the planet, with the non-human planet, in other words, all those species, and creates a very different relational economy. In other words, we're much more susceptible to understanding the dynamics of the resources around us, whether it's a river the land we use to grow our food, the animals that co-inhabit, uh, you know, the cohabit planet Earth with us. And that's what takes me very much to the Maasai. And, and obviously, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm married to a Maasai chief, but the whole way in which a lot of indigenous tribes conceive of themselves and whether you label it through the legal idea, this idea of the chthonic legal tradition, or whether you consider it to be people who are very closely embedded in nature, maybe have never left it. When you consider yourself to be part of that continuum, then it's a very different story because effectively you're dealing with a sufficiency. And in the world that I now inhabit here, when I'm here in Kenya, I'm not, when I'm not at UCL, uh, you get a very different understanding of what resilience is because resilience doesn't in any way talk about the amassing of goods and then losing it. Resilience talks about because you're much closer and more deeply engaged and embedded in the natural world, the resilience itself comes from the lack of a need to have a lot of consumer products, the idea that you can derive a lot of your needs from nature, the fact that resilience comes from community and almost I'm not saying it's completely substitutable, but it is, a, it is a sort of radical form of solidarity because it's saying you don't need to create artificial networks. You, you as a member of the human population can be an individual. You can be part of a network. And that being part of a network not only gives you resilience, but it also changes your relationship with resources. 
So why would you dig a great big hole in the ground and extract fossil fuel, which then creates a lot of pollution? Because actually what you're doing is you're polluting yourself, you're polluting your own life, you're polluting your own environment. And, and so it, it begs the question of how you treat the planet when you step back into this different way of viewing yourself and planet Earth and all of the non-human beings that are on that Earth. Now, we happen to have a few people who are thinking really um, in the long term about it because you don't change institutions overnight. But it's revealing that the Canadian government has now recognized this chthonic legal tradition, this idea of continuity that you can't separate humans from nature. In recent cases, in, uh, in the Northern Territories and in this area where you have the Inuit peoples, the indigenous peoples who have never left the land, essentially, they've always been there and they're embedded there. So slowly, slowly, you can see that some of the Western and, the, and developed countries are rediscovering what has never really been lost in Africa. It's really fascinating, Jackie. I, um, <clears throat> I have lots and lots of questions, but I know Zoe has a burning question, so I'm going to hand over to Zoe. Hi, hi, Zoe. <laughs> I, so I have questions that are circulating in my mind. The first question I want to ask is, can we hear the Maasai chief marriage story? I've been dying to find out more about that. Oh, okay. Well, it was a bit of an accident. I, uh, we met because one of my staff went down to the Maasai Mara to visit, uh, you know, to do a safari and ended up staying in a little village and met my husband um, and then said to me one day, could we invite some of the, the Maasai warriors up to the UN to come and give a, a Friday seminar? Sounds slightly ridiculous. But anyway, uh, I didn't know at the time that... Um, Patrick and, and the warriors who came had actually never left the Mara. They'd never even come to the city. This was their very first visit. So they turned up at the UN in full gear with, you know, spears or everything and all of the Maasai uh, attire, traditional attire. Anyway, they, they uh, much to the amusement of the UN guards, they came in and they gave a seminar. And um, during that process, when my husband met me, he didn't know who I was, but he, he basically said, that when he saw me, he thought, oh, this was the person that I dreamed I was going to marry when I was 11 years old. And, uh, but I wasn't aware because he couldn't speak English and I obviously couldn't speak uh, Kimasai. So this all went uh, beyond me. But when he returned to the village, he told his very, very old father um, about that. And um, even though it was really not a thing to do for a Maasai to marry a non-Maasai, or at least to marry a Westerner. Um, it, uh, it kind of culminated in me visiting and then going back again, but not realizing that this was a huge ceremony, one part of which was him becoming the new um, chief or the local chief and, and us getting married. And it was a very big ceremony and there were lots of people there with lots of spears and arrows and poison arrows and so on. So I felt with my uh, with my colleague and uh, a friend who traveled down there is not the time to say no. So I said yes. <laughs> and that was it. And so we, we got married. And uh, and so we've uh, yeah, we've been together ever since we built a brand new village. We took 300 people with us and uh, created a whole new a whole new setting with the warriors and so on. And we have been living very happily ever after. That's wonderful. That's a wonderful story. Um, <laughs> wow. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, and I guess sort of building on that, I, I've watched some of your lectures and you talk a lot about human values and placing meaning and connection. And I guess that's an, an example of you really embracing the human connection of, of the situation. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. And so kind of taking it back to the more, the global pressing issues, how do you think we can use these values um, to kind of secure human well-being and to really promote that in day-to-day -day life for everyone around the world? Um, and it's really striking that um, I think Indigenous peoples, traditions and values really should have more of a role on the global uh, stage. Um, and would you, I mean, do you think that they should be granted leadership positions in executive policy forums, for example? How do you think that would pan out? 
Well, I think it's fascinating that the Peruvians have just appointed or elected a leader who is an indigenous person. I think it's fantastic because there's a different mindset altogether. And I'll be the first to admit that I'd always been very sympathetic and had really reached out all the time I was at the European Environment Agency. I made um, a big effort and I traveled a lot to see and be with uh, indigenous peoples up in the Arctic, in Greenland and so forth. So I'd spent a lot of time with them. And then, of course, when I went to the UN, where they have a voice, they are stakeholders in many processes. But what I never truly understood until I've lived it, I've lived the life, I guess, of an indigenous team or tribe, um, how much it brings well-being to your to to a human life and and just to give you an example i mean i live in a mud hut so i have a mud hut which i built <laughs> and it's 16 foot by 16 foot and in that house i have a kitchen uh, two rooms two bedrooms and a living room in which the tribal leaders and the warriors come and we talk and so on and so forth but it is the nicest house I have. I have to tell you, it is, it is so simple, but it is everything. It provides shelter. It provides, uh, in a sense, a feeling of community. Everybody's house is the same, but they're not the same inside. They're slightly different. <clears throat> they can be fixed by everybody. So the ladies essentially look after them. They're made by the materials that are to hand. So cow dung and mud and water. Um, they're, they're lovingly looked after. They leak a little bit sometimes in the rainstorms, but I mean, that's just life. <clears throat> they're warm at night when it's cold, they're cool in the day and so on. But they become a focal point for young and old. And so children in the village, in a way, they, although they know who their parents are, they're looked after, they are looked after by the whole village. They can enter houses, but there's an enormous um, set of exchanges and traditions and respect for everyone, between everyone, with greetings that respect who you are in the sort of order of the tribe. And that ability to slow down and to reflect and to be respectful, it does many things to people. So it, the Maasai, for example, are extraordinarily patient in the way that they have conversations. Your job is to listen and to encourage the person to speak. So there's this sort of phrasing, eh, 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 all the time until the person has got their story out, whether they're young or they're old. Um, there's strong discipline, but at the same time, there's this incredible sympathy to forgive. You know, if someone does something wrong, you forgive them, and then you forgive them again, oh, and then you forgive them again, and again, and again, and again. Uh, you do good for one, because you know that in the future, you will need that help. So I think there's this systematic difference. And for young people, I truly notice the difference, which is that nobody gets left behind. There isn't a single person that gets left behind. Young, old, poor or rich, everybody effectively is taken care of in one way or another. There are no homeless people in the indigenous tribes. There's no one sitting out on their own. If you sit on your own, it's very dangerous actually, because there are animals that will get you. So for a young person, they feel in a sense, really protected. And I think that's what's missing in a lot of Western society, that people have lost their way and they're on their own and they don't find it easy to connect. Um, so I feel truly privileged to wake up in the morning and walk out and find 300 people and families and all these different people sort of wishing me well and coming and talking and so on. It's, it's quite an extraordinary life. Yes, it sounds absolutely fascinating and um to hear such a um a tangible first person perspective i think the western world is very insulated for all of our resources and knowledge we really don't know very much and you touched on this earlier <laughs> that um uh western governments are just starting to relearn what africa never forgot and um i think that that's a really powerful statement um it seems that individualism is not at all a factor in the way that life is lived. And um, you've spoken before about addictions to hierarchy and status and accumulation that are so prevalent in the Western world. And um, some have argued that they're rooted deeply in sociobiological drivers like E.O. Wilson, others. Um, so from a biological perspective, how do we then begin to reconcile innate drives for dominance and security? 
um, with the imperatives of societal well-being, specifically in the in the in the format that is seen in the Maasai China. Okay, let me let me just. Uh, I want to give a, um, um, a developed world perspective as well because I think it's important to keep the two. Otherwise, people think, "Oh my goodness, she's gone native, right?" So, <laughs> if I was to think about governments that are showing tendencies towards this, it's the we all, the Wellbeing Alliance governments. So, Scotland, Iceland, Wales, Finland, New Zealand. Now, why are they different? Well, because they're saying that it's the well-being of people. It's the considered views of the community that are important, not the individual, but the community. But the individual has a role in that community. So if you listen to some of the speeches made by the presidents, the prime ministers, or whatever they're called in those countries, you find that it's a very, very different style of government. And producing a well-being budget is already taking the first step towards where I think, and hopefully, we will move. And it's not that it does away with hierarchy, but hierarchy has to serve a purpose. It's not just there for the individual. And it's the same in the Maasai. So there's a hierarchy in terms of age. So an elder, to become an elder, you first have to have become a junior warrior. Then you go out in the bush. Then if you're a man, then you come back and then you serve your time, so to speak, and you serve the people. And at which time you then can become a junior elder. And then when the next age generation comes through, there's just been a, a big ceremony this year. Uh, they will become the senior elders and the young warriors become the junior elders. So everybody has a way, a rite of passage. But there's very few instances where the word I exists in the language. It's we. So they don't use the word I. You know, I am doing this. It's like we are doing this, we are doing this collectively, but even we in the terms of a person is doing it on behalf of the community. So there's the sense of the we and the community. So hierarchy um, is, is important, but it's an earned hierarchy. So particularly amongst the men, when they go out into the bush, and they normally, well, previously they had to live there for years. Like my, I think my husband was out in the bush for six years. You have to prove yourself to your peers. And you do that because each day you're under complete scrutiny of each other. So eventually the person who is the bravest, the person who can take on the, the, the sort of the worries of the tribe, the person who has the medicinal powers, these all emerge during the process when everyone is together. So there is a way in which your ability is rewarded. And through that, you then take on a responsibility. So the hierarchy is more about the responsibility that you bear as opposed to giving you access to powers. So they're earned in that sense. And, and there, there are some who carry them from generation to generation, but it's not really the case otherwise you would find that there would be an elite. And there, isn't, there truly isn't an elite amongst many of the indigenous peoples and certainly not within the Maasai. There are those who are respected for their views, for their wisdom. And there are some who've got a lot of cows uh, because they've been given a lot of gifts. But in a sense, they hold those cows for all generations. And I think that's the biggest difference. There's, there's less of an accumulative, um, possessive nature, which means that the hierarchy doesn't really have a role. So it seems that the, the application is different. Uh, the concept isn't done away altogether of hierarchy or accumulation. It's just purpose. It's a kind of earned. It's, it's got a purpose. And that purpose is for the common good as opposed to for the individual good. It's fascinating. Um, in, uh, to bring it back to a more present day event, um, I think COVID-19 has really exposed a lot of the, the weaknesses in society, particularly in the West. And I was wondering your perspective on, on whether you think that those countries that are, are embracing this new idea of, well, new, uh, rediscovering this idea of well-being, um, if their response to COVID have uh, shown that and whether their um, citizens have been able to, you know, embrace that idea of collectivism. And there was a lot of discussion about policies that were centered around young people sacrificing their, their freedom for protections of uh, those most vulnerable in the community. And um, 
those ideas are not necessarily rooted in, in individualism and these ideals that have been built up into Western society. So uh, in terms of, of COVID-19, how has that uh, changed or uh, exhilarated the uh, societal well-being uh, dynamic? I think sadly, it required the rule of law to make it happen. I don't really believe that in situations where the governments didn't step in and make things mandatory, that actually you would have had that response. Um, unfortunately, I say that. But on the other hand, one has to ask the question, is that going to leave an imprint? Is there a sort of legacy? And I, I actually feel that overall, our response to COVID was a very technocratic Western view this tension between trying to keep as many people out of the hospital systems because they were overwhelmed, trying to keep the kind of community safe up to a point, and then the kind of bursting out into sort of the economy and making that the argument as opposed to keeping people safe. It's all been rotating around this simple idea that um, the government is there to enforce a sense in which they seem to be unilaterally deciding on behalf of all of us. I think that's really, really the sad point is that we weren't able to rely on people's sense of well-being and community. It's no different, I think, in many countries. I think here, I think in Africa, there's just a sense of not despair so much as just, oh, it's just happening all over again. You know, we're not going to get the vaccines here. Uh, people are going to die. Thank goodness most people live in a rural environment. So, there's not as much collective gathering. There isn't really so much opportunity for, for these mass rallies at the moment. They're kind of discouraged. And here, you basically have to wear a mask wherever you go in Kenya. You just have to wear a mask. There is no doubt about it. But it's born out of the remembrance of things like Ebola, where this is deadly. I mean, it's really killing people. So if you get it, there's no one coming to your rescue. And I think that's that's the biggest difference. So this dependency, I think, in a lot of developed countries has been that the government will provide, so we'll accept the mandatory rulings because the government is providing. If you take away the safety net and you have to look after yourself, well, then you're more likely to do things both for yourself and for your community. So it's ironic that where there isn't a government, people need to step in and take care of themselves and therefore they will do the natural response. But going forward, um, you know, one hopes that there is a there is a greater collective understanding of how vulnerable we all are. And therefore, you know, you can't see easily the travel around the world. And, you know, there isn't going to be getting back to normal and so forth. But again, the countries that will suffer the most are those that depended on things like tourism, because tourists are not going to be able to come back to red listed countries. So Kenya is a red listed country. It's very happy to welcome people here because even though it is a red list country, it's relatively safe, but they can't then return back to their country without going into quarantine. So I'm, I'm sad to say that I think the building forward better or however you want to refer to it, hasn't really created the shift in minds and in thinking that one would have hoped. But what it has done is it has perhaps, it has perhaps raise the profile of science and knowledge, because I think generally people have recognized outside of a few kind of um, interesting political, you know, side areas that we wouldn't have been able to tackle this without the immense resources of the research community, the science community, the health community, and all of the amazing things that have been done just to produce a vaccine. So that has been, uh, for me, a fantastic outcome. And so I feel that Maybe, maybe society and business are listening to the climate change discussion more carefully. They are listening to the nature-based solution uh, debate, you know, debates, the ecosystem services more carefully than they did in the past. So that's been, for me, a, a, it has been a positive reaction. Um, and let's just hope that we can kind of continue that now, because it now makes business sense to respond in a much better way to these other two emergencies that are now literally upon us um, together with COVID. Yeah, so I'd like to pick up on this issue you raised around the difficulty of comprehending, comprehending our shared vulnerability and something which has come through in conversations with people who work in the kind of complexity space is, or also in the in sort of the Daniel Kahneman 
space as well around the limits of human cognition is that mm. this is just incredibly challenging uh, dynamics to get your head around, particularly at scale, the difficulty of drawing connections, the difficulty of of not getting swept up in abstractions, of making sense of complexity. All of these challenges are easier at small scale, which I think is coming through from what you're saying. And indeed, it, there, there seems to be a strong incentive at the smaller scale to to respond appropriately to to complexity, uh, which is which is, which is interesting, I suppose, because one might think that simplicity is the opposite of complexity, but I'm not sure that's actually the case. And I was um, I was struck um, by, from what you're saying, but there, there was a recent lively debate in the Financial Times about air travel, and a Cam- Cambridge professor was basically making the case that net zero means zero aviation perhaps with some restricted aviation for essential activities. And there was, a, there was a very strong response in the letter section for and against this this proposition. Many people just do not seem willing to give up access to what we might regard as the luxuries of industrial civilization, mm-hmm. uh, including academics. I mean, Timothy Morton recently announced that he'll no longer be flying for professional reasons. But most people are keen to get back to normal post-COVID. And you also mentioned the frugal economy. Um, you know, is there a possibility that a post-carbon world will require us to reduce our consumption, particularly our luxury consumption? So what is your view on that, that possibility, that prospect? And then from a, from a communal or even Maasai perspective, what are the questions then that we should really be asking of our culture today or perhaps of our colleagues and, and family and friends? You know, for example, what are you willing to give up? What are you willing mm. to relinquish? Well, I, you, you, this is a fantastic way to kind of wrap up all of these different things we've talked about, because in the end, it does come down to personal choice. And we are extremely lucky, I would say, in the in the Western world, in the developed world, that we have many choices. But actually, I feel that choice is a burden sometimes, because living in a very frugal way, uh, by choice, perhaps, but also by necessity, because there's just no money. I mean, if you live in the Masai Mara and there are no tourists, there is no money. So you fall back on the idea of, well, yeah, but we survive for millennia. So hang on, what's the problem here? We just go back to the way we, then my husband says to me, we'll just go back to the way we did. I said, well, I haven't got enough money to pay the school fees this month. You know, I've got 5,000 5, shillings, $5,000, da, da, da. Don't worry, don't worry, necessary, and it's fine. We just go back to how we were. And that's, you eat once a day, if you're lucky, you, you eat off the land, um, you've got all these people around you, but everyone's in the same boat. So let me step forward now into so COVID. What did COVID do? Well, the first thing that was really noticeable was by forcing everyone to be online. And we are fortunate in Kenya in that a lot of people have access to you know, smartphones and they can get access affordably to Wi-Fi and so forth. But given that, It was fantastic. It was liberating. We were having conversations that in the past we couldn't have attended, just didn't have the travel funds. And that just disappeared overnight. So we've had some of the best conversations over the last year where you got all the voices in the room and nobody felt apologetic. I mean, actually, ironically, a lot of the people that I'm surrounded by here in Africa had better Wi-Fi connectivity than somebody in the UK. So, you know, here's the irony that we've got a young population who are connecting and it would be such a travesty if as we go forward people say oh well now we're going to go back to traveling just for the sake of being in the same room when you know that three quarters of the world can't enjoy that privilege of being in the room so i think this is a kind of uh, apartheid and i really would like to fight against it that although people complain about being online, if you've never had the chance to travel, you can't imagine what it's like to be able to talk to people, like my students talking to people in America, talking to students in Latin America. So the next big thing for me is language. And we are moving in AI terms towards a way where we could have conversations with people in many, many different places in multiple languages. And that's something that we should really, really encourage because I see the challenges when I talk with the ladies and the people in the tribe where they have their own language. It's a fabulous language, really complicated language. Um, And as soon as you take them out into the two languages of the country, English and Swahili, they're immediately disadvantaged, immediately. Immediately. 
So we need to absolutely re regard tribal languages as being essential to human life, to, to society, to complexity, to solving problems, to getting ideas and solutions in. So again, we need to help young people have that facility in multiple languages, so education, to be able to converse freely and openly, and at the same time, be able to keep all of those special cultural traditions alive through language by ensuring there is that sort of seamless way in which people can communicate. So that's really important for me. And then I think, ultimately, the frugal economy will take its form wherever you are. So in the case of maybe many of the tribes here in Africa, it might be as Chipkoge said, he's, you know, he wins, the, he wins the, the marathon. And yet when you look at what he has chosen as his life, he still lives in his very modest house in Iten. He gets up in the morning, has a cup of tea, a piece of bread and a banana. He eats a little bit of ugali, some rice and vegetables and a bit of meat during the day and a bit of ugali and vegetables at night and maybe a banana. That's it for the day never changes day in day out and he doesn't feel in any way disenfranchised at all so outside you might call that a frugal economy but he feels enriched that is the that's the life that he has and i think for billions of people that is the daily life so the frugal economy is perhaps a misnomer it's not that you're doing without it's just that it's frugal in the very best sense it's, a, it's an economy that nourishes you and if you put that together with a relational economy, which is about the complexity of all those networks and all the different social networks that you have, the bridging networks, the bonding networks, these are all incredibly important ways in which you can have the richest life possible. Now, travel, travel is a very, it's a very kind of, it's a sort of a personal choice because if you take the sting out of the tail and say, you don't need to travel for work because we're gonna connect people just as we've done in COVID, I, I have a new startup and the whole of the staff are distributed all over the world. We have our regular stand-ups, everyone's working remotely, and yet we have an incredible esprit de corps. So I'm, you know, unless you're in the business of having to go to a location to manufacture and to do things, I think broadly speaking, travel then becomes much less of a professional issue and more of a personal choice. And for me, of course, I want to see my family in the UK and I want to see my family in Kenya. So I will continue to travel. Now I want to go knocking at the door of Virgin who have done this and I want to have aviation fuel that is net zero. I would like to see us not have to rely on fossil fuel to put engines up in the air. We're incredibly clever at developing things. We've developed a vaccine for goodness sake in a year and a half. So what's stopping us from actually creating new fuel forms that are routinely used to power all of the different forms of transport. Electric transport, um, you know, all of this is, is all possible. And my colleague uh, Bertrand Picard showed that through the solar impulse. Um, so, you know, if you can have a solar flight, then okay, that was a sort of test flight, but we can do far, far more for all forms of transport. So I think, you know, the, we have to push to have these things. Same as plastics, the whole conversation now about ridding ourselves of, Un, of, of the non-essential plastics. Um, fantastic things are happening as we speak. We're moving towards a UN treaty, but before that, business is already saying, countries are already saying, Singapore is saying, if you eat in a restaurant, you will no longer be allowed to have plastic utensils. You have to be served with sort of non-disposable, reusable, and every single thing takes off from there. And, I, and that's what I say, if you've got, if you have got the way to avoid creating these problems, we will end up in a far, far cleaner, better world because we will have thought about where our spoon, our, our glass, our plate comes from. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that it's not COVID that's done that. I think it's just this realization that the planet and ourselves have got to have a different relationship going forward. We have to develop a different way of living on planet Earth. Really appreciate Jackie, you taking on these very big questions, providing such an articulate response to all the, the different dimensions uh, to perhaps take a different direction and riff on what you just said about the value of languages. 
I mean, language as a kind of portal of discovery, uh, language as a, an invitation to humility, to openness, to learning, to listening. Um, the importance in terms of how we comprehend reality of both the first, second and third person perspective. And I've noticed in your work that you're quite you're, you're quite exercised by this very interesting fault line between, say, the Western rational science approach, which is very good at the third person perspective, but is rather less inclined to entertain the validity of the first and second person perspective. And you draw on the work of, say, uh, Simone Weil, um, the, the, the importance of the social imaginary, the importance of the human need for rootedness, for appreciation of it. Of, of human experience, interiority. How do you reconcile these two points of view, which are often framed as antagonistic? And why is it so important to try and uh, really, to, to really take seriously both perspectives when, when approaching very challenging human predicaments? I think that to be a, to be a good scientist these days, you need to be able to have empathy. I, I, I can't see these days, except in maybe a very few cases, that divorcing yourself from the real world um, is going to get you anywhere. And that's why, in a sense, I don't believe in big missions, because missions imply it's a big technology piece and we're all going to get together behind one thing. No, it's the noise, it's the complexity, it's the babble that's going to get you to ultimately a solution which is fit for everybody. Because everyone will have, they'll have a slightly different version of it. So, yes, we have, you know, some of the principles of how the natural world operates. And, and that has to, you know, withstand a lot of attack from left, right and centre. So we still need to be thinking about that. But gravity will work. It will bring water from the mountain. But if I've never brought water from the mountain through a pipe down into a village, gravity has never really played any role. But then as soon as I do it and I get gravity to work for me and then I explain it to, let's say, an indigenous tribe who's never been to school, they don't even know what gravity is. And then you say, but this is a force that we can use to do something completely different. The next thing is you'll hear them saying to the tourists saying, oh, yes, yes, we bring our water into the village by gravity. You know, you know it's just it's like this absorption of knowledge. And so that's why I'm thinking that we need a lot more people working in the interface, not just the science policy interface that we often hear talked about, but just the science the, the empathetic scientists, I might call people, who can explain how the world is working with a rudimentary explanation, but then in the language of the people we're in, interacting with. And this is why I think language is so, so important, because it's pejorative to say, OK, the science, the language of, of uh, science is English. It, it's happened to be that. It was German. It was other languages in the past. And when I talk to my colleagues in the UN who are very disciplined, and, you know, everyone knows sort of six languages and we can all go backwards and forwards. But at the end of a day, um, it's almost as if people, you, you, you adopt these different persona. If you speak in Spanish, you become a sort of different person. When you're speaking to my German colleagues, I become a different person. And, and you must never forget that, that language brings with it a different understanding of the person you're with and talking to. And that's truly important. That's the empathy that I think we need. And with empathy, you can then envision different futures, which means you can then act in wholly appropriate ways instead of this forceful way where things have to be mandatory and, and you know, essentially rigorously a, a achieved and attained to. Mm. Yeah, well, there's there's so so many directions we could go, I think, from there. But I I'm aware of the time, and I think we are rolling towards the close. Uh, I'd like to hand over to Zoe to ask our last question. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Um, so, I guess from like a young person's perspective, um, there's something that really resonated with me in what you said uh, in our talk, and you talk about power being a responsibility to bear I'm not quite sure power but in terms of the hierarchy and I find that a very interesting concept especially to take moving forward and I think my question is what what would you say or hope for sort of my generation and the generations 
younger than me. Sorry, I had a brain. Mm -hmm. um, you know, empathy, I feel like is not widespread enough. And I feel like empathy should be a responsibility almost. Um, and I guess how, how do we promote more empathy and what would you hope for my generation and future generations to acquire that more deeply and to feel that more deeply and just to feel more deeply altogether? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I don't envy being young again. I mean, I, I, I mean, I love. I would love to be young again. So run and do all these various things that I particularly don't want to do anymore. What I really do see, though, is the need for young people to connect. Because once you connect at whatever level, you start to build empathy. And so, I think genuinely, empathy, and then responsibility, and feeling that responsibility for communities that you interact with will come naturally if you're if everybody in a sense if you're human will feel that i'm i'm also saying let's extend that to the natural world let's recognize sentient beings let's recognize what nature can do for each and every one of us as well as collectively and take that as a badge of honor that essentially protecting your bit of planet earth no matter where it is whether it's in an urban environment or whatever um, being proud of that is is really re responsive is very very important. Um, respecting each other's views is important, and I think we have created a culture, certainly in the developed countries, of almost too much hubris. Uh, you, you know, you, you you get up to get on, and you know you stand on people to get on, and it, it's it's a very destructive, very very destructive way to live. So reaching out recognizing that you're all in the same boat We're, we are all in the same boat together but as a young generation um, building liaisons building networks that are not due to some kind of elitism but are actually linked around a common sense of each other of respect for each other it, immediately that will change an individual because they'll have this sense of belonging and and it's the belonging that is important but not belonging in such a way that it uh, is exclusive. Belonging in an inclusive way is critical. So I think young people have got a huge challenge and yet you've got the greatest opportunity because whether or not it would happen, but my dream would be that we no longer have a world where you work absolutely as hard as you possibly can for the first 40 years of your working life and then you get let off the reins I would love it if we had the first, say, 10 years of your adult life somehow paid for, subsidized, I don't know, where you could actually explore the world together, meet other people, see what's happening around the world. And only after that, with the skills that you've acquired, start to come back to maybe a working life where it's maybe not even five, six, seven days a week. It's a very different kind of way of working where there's enough sustenance, the frugal economy allows you to gather and gain things, but you do so on the basis of a far greater level of personal experience and wisdom and not simply what you got out of books. So, yeah, I'm a great believer in sort of reversing the life course. <laughs> kind of like sending all young people out into the bush, but globally. Yes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. To learn to rely on each other, to build those linkages, and then to come back into a fully responsible life where you take care of family, friends, society. And, and actually, you sort of take on that responsibility because you've gained the wisdom and the maturity to do it. Thank you so much for that answer. It's been such a privilege um, to be able to have this conversation with you and to hear all your amazing insights and life experiences thank you. <laughs> thank you yeah i'd just like to echo that jackie thanks so much for joining us today it's been a very rich conversation i'm delighted to to count you among my colleagues at at uh, you bet <laughs> you um, bet and we wish you the very best in your work and of course in your maasai community uh, it sounds like we have a lot to learn <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much it's been great great fun thank you thank you Thanks for tuning into Global Governance Futures. To get access to all of our content and to stay up to date with future Zoom calls, workshops and events and more, check us out at ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash 
governance. And if you like this content, please do leave us a comment and subscribe. Until next time.